up my devices. Right, it's my um, it's my first time back in a church meeting in this building today since uh, March, I think, and it's amazing. Absolutely love being here and seeing you all, and um, especially there's people here I haven't met before, haven't met you guys. Hello, I'm Dan. Simon, hello again. I'm trying here. Hang on. Ooh. I'll leave it at that. So we are in a little series where we're talking about Ephesians, which is a book in the Bible, in the New Testament, that St. Paul uh, wrote to this church in Ephesians. Um, it's They were a bunch of new Christians, basically, a new church that uh, had popped up. And it, this letter kind of went around lots of different churches in Western Turkey. So it wasn't just to the Ephesian church, it was to uh, a load of churches. And it's um, like an essay, really. Is it? Is everyone, I don't put anyone on the spot, but if you've read it over the last few weeks, it's sort of mental because it's so dense and so full of crazy concepts, the letters to the Ephesians and ideas. Um, so what I want to try to do in the first few minutes of talking today is explain some of the weirder themes in Ephesians, um, which I think will be very encouraging to us, because this letter is basically saying that the church is God's secret weapon. There we go. Um, that's what it's saying, basically, that God's victory against evil is through the church, through Jesus, but us following. And, you know, we have all the power that Jesus has. So... If we could get slightly excited about that by the time we leave the building, I would be very encouraged because this is the best news the world has ever heard or seen. And it was brilliant this morning to come in here and have people singing at the front about God being good and us being thankful. And, you know, there's water pouring in the building here and there's a virus tearing through the country. But there's a bunch of people in this building and loads of others singing that he is good and then there's, you know, Simon, that was brilliant what you said. Because that, like it says in, um, there's one of the other books in the Bible called Revelation, which is a bit mad. But it basically has this image of, of Jesus with a sword coming out of his mouth. And it's, so what it's saying is that a power is in our words. And you saying what you did this morning and others giving their testimony, it's just so full of power. It's brilliant. And that's what this book, Ephesians, is all about. So it's it's fantastic, um, and I'm going to try to land the plane of my thoughts in the next 20 minutes, because I do struggle with that. Should we have the next, next slide? Cool. Now, we probably can't shout out, but if you can identify all the characters on the left-hand side of that screen, stick your hand up. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Okay, so we have top left, Robin Hood in the form of a fox, my personal favorite Disney movie. Uh, we got Aladdin, your favorite. Yep. Bottom left is Lion King, that's Simba. Amy's favorite, Hannah's favorite. Uh, Little Mermaid, Lisa's favorite. And uh, I guarantee you that if Emma unmuted, she would tell you all that that was my favorite. But it's not, but she likes to wind me up with that. Okay. What would all of those characters be seen to be? Good guys. Goodies. Protagonists. Blimey. Yeah. Not antagonists. Okay. Protagonists. They're the goodies. Okay. Who can identify everyone on the right-hand side? Amy. Yeah. Okay. On the left, we've got the Sheriff of Nottingham, who is, I'm never sure what he is. I think he's a wolf. A secondary antagonist, right? Aaron's been to university. Um, top right is Jafar. Nice. Yeah. He's from Aladdin. Bottom left, Scar. Scar's horrible. You have. <laughs> Scarface. Um, yeah, Scar is horrible. I, I personally think that he is 
just the villain that I find the most dreadful. Uh, on the bottom right is Ursula, who's just gross, frankly. Um, but they would be known as baddies. Okay. Dan, where on earth are you going with this? Um, right. If we have the next one, next slide. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. Now, this is a weird slide. You don't need to pay too much attention to it. But in the Bible, who are the baddies? This is my point. Okay? Because the Bible's full of characters. Um, and we tend to think that, you know, the devil, we'll all have heard, who seems to be half goat, half man holding a fork. That's just nonsense. Forget that ever exists. That's not what the devil is. Um, but then we have bad characters like Goliath, you know, who's definitely a baddie. Um, and then there's all sorts of horrible kings. And if you read the book of Judges, don't read it if you're under 16 years old, because it's horrendous. But basically, there's all sorts of horrible human baddies. And then there's lots of weird spiritual baddies. So there's the devil who turns up in a snake. There's a snake in the garden. That's the bottom picture there. Who's like... He's not a snake that bites people. He whispers little words in their ear, which corrupts their thinking and, and causes them to be divided and doubtful. And then um, the top middle picture, those are the gods of Egypt. So the, the gods of Egypt, like which we wouldn't have think even exist, are baddies in the Bible. Then on the right-hand side, there's four horses there. What on earth is that about? In the book of Revelation, these horses represent things like oppression and war and inequality and death. And they are ideas of baddies in the Bible. And then in the book of Daniel, on the left-hand side, the big statue, Daniel has this mad vision about this huge statue. And it represents, by different materials in the statue, all of these different human empires. So the Bible is really really complex and if you struggle to read it you're probably approaching it in the right spirit because if it's not easy it is really complex um but point being all of all of these baddies however some of them appear physically the real battle is going on at a spiritual level and that's what all of these different figures represent so the snake is a really good one because that's a it's quite a basic idea that we God created the world to be beautiful and to be enjoyed and to be a garden and he created us to be in it and to be tending the garden and nurturing it and making it into something amazing but then something comes along like a snake and it just they probably didn't even know what a snake was no reason to fear it but it just starts saying things that make Eve Adam and Eve think, actually, is, is this perfect? Is it? And then that creates this seed of doubt and this division. And that's so subtle, isn't it? But that is what the key baddie in the Bible is this spirit of doubt and division. And it has lots of different names, but it's a spiritual one. Let's just have the next one up. Right, have you all been with me so far? Raise your hand if you've got the faintest clue what I'm on about. That's good. Oh, most people, good. Okay. It's important, this, because this Ephesians is full of references to spiritual baddies. And if we don't know what that's talking about, we kind of miss the whole point of the letter. So, um, this slide, Zoomers might be easier because they can kind of see it more. But on the left-hand side of this slide... We've got a circle. You can't see it very well from here, but I'll describe it. In the Bible, people didn't know about atoms and things inside of atoms, and they didn't know about the universe or the Big Bang. Um, you know, we have all of these scientific advances, as, as we would think of them, but the Bible doesn't use that language. What the Bible talks about is is there being the world as we know it underneath our feet literally this is what they actually thought under our feet is something called the grave shale that's 
what happens to a body when it when it dies, it decomposes and it goes down. So that's where they thought you went when you died. Then up above, what could they see when they looked up? They could see something blue, which let water in. And they could see stars up there as well, and planets and things like that. So their idea was that up above, there's a great big load of water up there. And they're also living up there are these things which move around, and some of them would fly across the sky occasionally, but some of them, the big ones, keep going around and around and moving, and actually it's really helpful when they move because we can see, and we have warmth and light, and we can grow our plants. So they, they associated what was up there with spiritual beings, good ones and bad ones. Stay with me. Uh, above everything, literally above everything, if you looked up, was where God was. That's what thinkers in the Bible thought. God was up there, and his spirit was down here with us, moving through everything. But spiritual beings and powers live somewhere up there. Now, on the right-hand side, that's from a movie called The Matrix. So if you think that's how they thought, God in the Bible, spoke to people then and used their understanding of how the universe worked. When we use a computer, which we all do, or a phone, we think, let's use this, we think we're looking at a slide which has a picture on it. They're not, all that is, is packets of information, ones and zeros basically, which is what this, the green, green and black part is. It's code, it's computer code. You're not actually it, you know, it comes together to look to us like something on a slide, but what it actually is is something very different. It's just little, I don't even know what it is because I'm not a computer scientist, but Chris Turner would have a good idea. Digital packets of data, Simon knows. Um, but that, so that what, what I'm trying to get at is it's quite weird to understand, but there is a reality to a computer which is not the thing that you're looking at. What you think you're interacting with, being pictures, and when you press this key, the letter K comes up or whatever, that's not what's happening. There's little packets of information and numbers behind all of that. And I personally, I find that a more helpful understanding of the spiritual world than looking up and seeing things moving in the sky. I imagine it as behind everything that we can see and the drips coming out the ceiling and you guys milling around, and everyone wearing masks because of the horrible virus. Behind all of that, but no less real, there is a spiritual world always going on, which you can imagine as being a bit like the numbers of the matrix. And that world is equally as real as ours. And the book of Ephesians is telling the church and is telling us things about that world. So, Baddies, baddies in the Bible, living in the spiritual world and having influence on us in this physical world. Is everyone still with me? That's deep. Right. I, I think I've gone as deep as I'm going to go. Um, let's have the next slide. Okay. There's a bit of graffiti on the left of the slide, which is a funny face with crosses for eyes and a sort of saucepan hat. And it's graffiti that says, welcome to Dirty Twerton. Has anyone seen that on the wall? Yeah? <laughs> he knows he's done it. OK. So the tag says, the Restraining Order Gang. Don't know who they are, but they're somewhere here, you know, within about half a mile of us. That, you know, welcome to Dirty Twerton. You know that I have thought, but I'm not going to do it because I'd probably lose my job, of, of changing the D and the I into a P and an A and having it welcome to party twerton. Because, you know, that's just, that for me is a real example of sp these kind of spiritual powers that are living in all of these numbers behind everything influence. Oh, Lisa's got something. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. 
I'll tell you Zoom is in a sec. Yeah, okay. So Lisa's saying, because Lisa is the font of local knowledge, that there's a big debate on Facebook about this piece of graffiti because it, it's very degrading. It says, welcome to Dirty Twerton. And do you know where they put it? On the arch as you walk up into Twerton from the Lower Bristol Road? Go on, Simon. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, so Simon's saying that, um, is it actually wrong? It says, welcome to Dirty Twerton. Uh, at some level, that's true. <laughs> like, it is dirty. There's piles of rubbish lying around. And Simon was saying he's, he's been attacked. Um, so the, what I'm trying to say is, there is spiritual battles that are going on in Twerton. And they are no less real than the graffiti you see on the wall. There is an influence in our parish where we live and on all of us. Personally, I think part of the influence is that when I came in this morning full of passion to talk to you about the amazing thing the church is doing, the first thing that happened is I saw that, water pouring through the ceiling, which as of this week, I'm supposed to you know, be responsible for as church warden. And actually Luke's done everything this morning, so thank you for that, Luke, and a couple of other guys. Um, but do you see what I mean? That, for me, is a little bit of attack saying, Dan, be stressed. You know, be stressed and don't be uh, free to channel what God wants to say to the church because there's water pouring in and it's your problem. So I just want to um, bum us out a little bit by reading some of these stats. Twerton has the highest number of domestic abuse calls received by police. The greatest proportion of police referrals to children's social services. This is in, in Baines, Bath and North East Somerset. The greatest proportion of family ref, families working with social services. The lowest adult participation in sports and recreation. The lowest five-a-day veg consumption. Those two things lead to the greatest health inequality. Do you remember one of those horses that we saw in the Bible? Is it's oppression? It, it, one of them is oppression. One of them is inequality. This is this is the spiritual reality to what's going on where we live. The highest percentage of children living in poverty here. Do you know why that's particularly annoying? Because the highest number of children in Baines live here. So we have the most number of children proportionally, but we have the highest poverty for children. All of which is um, it's getting worse, <laughs> widening inequality. So in the numbers that are the reality behind what we experience in Twerton, there is some serious negative influence, you know, for us as a church and as followers of Jesus here. So we're all really bummed out now. Let's take a deep breath and uh, try to smile behind our masks because that is not the end of the story, not at all. Let's have the next slide. Hey, look, this one's much nicer. Right, so this is what um, Ephesus, which is, in case you're wondering, the Ephesian letter was written to the church in Ephesus. This is what it probably looked like. This is 2,000 years ago. It looks amazing. There's loads of beautiful Roman kind of villas and buildings and colonnades and a massive amphitheater, like a stadium. There's a, a, a natural, well, like a man-made harbor at the far end of it where all the ships came in. Um, and this letter was written about 30 years after Jesus had been walking around and then mysteriously disappeared and went up to heaven. But that's their conception, up to heaven. Maybe he went behind the numbers. <laughs> you know, we just, we don't know. Point being, Jesus, um, in one level, went into the spiritual reality and left something behind in our reality, which is the spirit in the church. It says the church is his body. So he's not, you know, physically, he departed the scene, but not spiritually at all. We are Jesus' physical body now. Have you noticed, ever seen that in Ephesians? It says it in a couple of places. We are actually Jesus' body. So all of the stuff that he was doing is now the church doing that. So the, 
30 years ago, I was a, a six-year-old, a five-year-old, and I used to, because I was like into church then as well, I used to wish that Jesus was alive now when I was a six-year-old because I thought it'd be a lot easier. <laughs> that was very wrong. But, you know, if I could see everything that was happening and see all the healings and things like that, you know, I wished it would happen now. But you know what the actual truth is, which is really challenging, is that Jesus' body is still with us, but it's us. We're all members of it. So that is, you know, what we are challenged to live as. Some of you weren't born 30 years ago, were you? That's, that's distressing, people in this room. Um, what, were you doing, what were you doing 30 years ago? Just have a moment, if you were alive then, and just think to yourself, what, what were you up to? So I was in primary school. In 1990, I drew a picture of a piano, and I remember, because I wrote 1990 at the bottom of it, and I was five or six years old. And it doesn't seem that long ago, even though I now have a five-year-old son, well, in two days' time. It doesn't seem that long ago, does it? So th this letter was written, you know, I'm thinking back to when I was five. It doesn't seem long ago. This letter was written to the church. And it wasn't that long ago that Jesus had been among them. It's quite, you know, this is it's quite fresh, Paul's letter. I always think it's helpful just to have an idea. If you have a Bible which tells you when the books were written, it's quite useful to pay attention to it because it can help you understand them a bit more. Let's have our next slide. Hey, look, I can see Arthur. He's eating something. Okay, so I'm going to read some little passages from Ephesians because it is brilliant. Is everyone slightly more excited than when they started? Yeah? Just wave or something. Hey, there we go. His power, God's power for the church, for us who believe, is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. That's pretty powerful. And seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion. So the reason I showed you that slide of how the Israelites understood the world, look at that, seated him far above all rule, authority, power and dominion. So they actually thought he was above it. That's you know, how they conceived of it. For us, Jesus is smashing the numbers behind the scenes. If it helps you to think of it like computer code, Jesus is inside the code and he is just bossing it, completely reworking it, rewriting it, um, working through it and smashing it to bits, totally in control of it. And God placed all things under his feet. Remember, that's how they thought, down under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything. That sounds great. For who? For the church, for us. He's smashing the numbers, and that is for us. That's what we're, what's what we're doing and going to do. That's what Simon's doing by giving that awesome testimony earlier. The church, which is his body, the fullness of Jesus, who fills everything in every way. And then Ephesians 2, God raised us up with Christ and seated us, with him in the heavenly realms. So we're up there. We, this is the truth that's very hard to believe when you see Welcome to Dirty Twerton and all of those statistics. We are smashing the numbers as well. We are seated as, Jesus, as Christ's body, the church. This is the power that is available to us. Seated us with him in the heavenly realms in order that in the coming ages, rabbit hole, won't go there, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. He wants to show the world, show the spiritual powers, how amazing he is through the church. Right, let's have the next one. His purpose, God's purpose, was to create in himself one new humanity. And what did that voice, that snaky voice, it created doubt and division and hostility. His purpose was to create one new humanity, no doubt, no division, making peace and in one body. 
the body of the church, but in Jesus' body, who absorbed all of this horrible spiritual evil for us and was raised a new life out of God's love. And in one body to reconcile them to God through the cross in which Jesus put, or God, put to death that hostility. For through him, we have access to the Father by one spirit. So you'll see the number one, loads, in Ephesians, because it's talking about unity. And if we can model that in the church, if we can be unified, honestly, we're going to be totally unstoppable. That, that's what Ephesians was encouraging the church, and that's the encouragement for us. So for the next few weeks of preaching uh, in our celebration Sundays, first and thirds, we're going to be talking about the back end of the letter, which is Ephesians 4 to 6. And Paul really changes how he's talking. And instead of talking in these you know, crazy concepts that I'm trying to help us understand today, he's talking about ways that we can grow in our unity together. And so he talks about when you get angry with people, uh, don't take it to, you know, you know, don't sleep on it, basically, deal with it. Um, wives and husbands, there's a bit there. Good luck to whoever's preaching on that because it's a tricky one. Um, uh, but um, parents and children, you know, be unified, um, you know, and don't wind each other up. I have failed that today. I wound my children up this morning and it was totally my fault. Live and Arthur, I'm sorry. Um, so that's, you know, have that in your mind when, when you come back and hear the next few bits of teaching. What, what it's all about is unifying us because in our unity, we are demonstrating Jesus' um, victory over these powers in the numbers which are creating doubt and division. Uh, so his intent was that now, this is the, Ephesians 3 is what I'm supposed to talk on, and I've got one verse from it. Ephesians 3, 10. This is mega. His, God's intent was that through the church, the manifold or the, the many-sided um, wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So the way, you know, the, the, the reality that's in those numbers, which is behind everything we see, the way God wants to show his power and his authority is through the church, is through us. And it's, you know, watching the video of people doing the missional communities, Simon saying his thing and the rest of us saying our things, um, you know, praying, uh, like you were saying, for a miracle with health, all of these things, this is us stepping into the authority that God has for us as a church. And it, this is where we need to encourage each other and we need to persevere. And Ephesians 6 says that. It says stand. And when you can't stand anymore, keep standing. And we will all do that together. Because in, in what we can see and perceive, we see graffiti and we see the ceiling falling in and we see people being sick and we see everyone having to wear a mask because there's a horrible virus. But the truth behind that, in that, the realm of the numbers, in the spiritual realm, is that Christ is victorious and that we are called to step into that and to speak it out. And whatever we see in this realm, which we hope we will see improvements in, we know in faith that we have the victory and the power and the authority. It's very, very exciting. Um, and when whoever talks on Ephesians 4, the, the, it, it just spells it out really clearly that it's about unity because it's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. Keeps using the word one. And a, a little geeky bit here, which is great, the seven ones. And in the Bible, seven is a complete, complete idea. It's a bit like 100 for us. We understand 100%. Yeah, 100%, done. For Hebrews, seven was the same kind of thing. Right. Um, have you stayed with me for that? Thank you. No one can call out, so it's just a few little... Uh, mm, yeah. uh, I want to finish. Should I have the next slide? Last one. Anyone recognize this? Berlin Wall. Berlin Wall. Well done. Okay. This is... This is 30 years ago. Do you know this? 30 years ago this, this weekend, the reunification of Germany. Simon remembers it. He's just saying he remembers it coming down. Um, I think I can just about remember this. 
Yeah, so that there's a picture. So at the bottom right hand side, the little picture, there's a piece of the wall falling down. And the, the bigger picture is people on the West German side of the wall passing the pot of coffee up to the Red Army who are, you know, uh, on top of the wall. This, so this is the fall of the Berlin Wall. This is basically the end of the Cold War, which ruined millions of lives. You know, and um, Stalinism, which um, I'm slightly going off track now, but you'll see where I'm going to. Millions upon millions upon millions of lives were ruined. I mean, you know, millions of deaths by a horrible combination of war and political oppression all through the 20th century. First World War, Second World War, Cold War. And there were millions and millions of deaths in each of those all across the world. The spiritual battle going on then was absolutely immense. You know, it just, this virus is horrible, but we're, you know, thank God, we're not living with the fear of London going up in smoke or something. Um, so I just want to read, I read something amazing about this this week, about the churches in, um, in East Germany. So just a little bit of background. When the Second World War finished, Germany was carved up. There was West Germany, which was, you know, we would see as the goodies, the democratic and everything like that, part of the West. And East Germany was taken over by the communists um, uh, under Stalin and in a really horrible regime. Think of North Korea now. That's kind of roughly where you're getting at. So I just want to read this. I've cobbled it together from an account by a guy called Gerhard Soter, who was a, a professor of theology at the University of Bonn. Right, I'm, going to, I'm just going to read this now. After World War II, the Soviet Union, as the uh, communists, took over most of the countries of Eastern Europe, including East Germany. Over the following years, isolated behind the Berlin Wall, you can see there, from 1961, East German Christians felt increasingly repressed as their faith was deemed incompatible with the communist ideology. That ideology believed the world should be transformed into a state of everlasting peace and justice, but according to communist principles. East Germany was the only country in which the communists encountered a large and well-established national church, one of the few remaining institutions able to act together on both sides of the divided country. The church ran charities and hospitals, nursing homes, community health centers. It was a, the church was a unique bridge between East and West, which enabled a confidential of exchange of ideas and insights, and was able to support families which the government couldn't or wouldn't support. The communist regime suppressed church activities where they interfered with its goals. And in the 1970s, the East German government mandated military education classes in all schools. Any of you have young children, just think about them teaching your children about tanks and war. Um, you know, it's horrible. And they were giving out toys, war toys, in kindergartens, which is there like primary schools. So in response to this, a Christian peace movement grew up in East Germany, adopting the slogan, which I can't say, Schwerter zu Pluchschaden. Um, don't speak German. But that means, that's, you can see it in the circle there, um, it means swords to plowshares. So this is from uh, Isaiah and Micah in the Bible, two prophets, and it says, in those days, in the day of the Lord, when God is victorious, they will beat their swords into spades, I'll call them, or plows, turn weapons into productive tools. Okay, so they seized on, on that idea. This was cleverly based on a favor, famous Soviet monument, a, a big statue, um, which meant that the state authorities couldn't ban this symbol. They were in charge of everything. They could stop you saying anything or giving anything out, but they couldn't stop the church from using that logo because it was a Soviet logo, so clever. The, the Swords to Plowshares logo was printed on fabric patches and young people proudly stitched it onto their clothes and their bags as a symbol of peaceful resistance. 
In the late 1980s, protests increased over the denial of basic civil rights, freedom of speech, information and travel, and the church began running regular pray for peace services. Eventually, the East German government couldn't ignore the Christian peace movement and allowed a national peace march in 1987. And thousands of nonviolent activists took their banners and marched to Dresden Station. That's not in Berlin, but you know this was nationwide. So the city uh, mayor of Dresden and the bishop of Dresden campaigned for peaceful dialogue, and the two and, and two Catholic priests also entered into talks with the state police. This is not like talking to our police. Okay, this is like the Stasi. Th these are police who put you in jail and you're gone for good. This was so brave, and that's the Catholic Church. You know, we shouldn't forget that. The church is not just as in the Anglican movement. There were some forged elections in 1989, and Christians continued to speak out against political injustice. And later that year, church pastors began to host what were known as roundtable talks between the government party leaders, civil rights activists, and others, which paved the way for a peaceful transition of power to a reunified Germany. And the activists took to the streets, and there, oh, it gets me this, what they were calling was, we are one people. That was, that was the chant, we are one people. What is Paul writing about in Ephesians? One new humanity, no division. We are one people. And the wall was torn down 30 years ago, or 31 years ago, the wall. And on the 3rd of October, 1990, so that is, you know, 30 years ago and one day, the reunif reunification of Germany was formally realized as East and West joined to become fully integrated into what we now know as Germany. The Soviet Union, that evil empire, totally evil, was dissolved the next year and the Cold War was ended and no one had to live in fear of a horrible nuclear bomb going off. The Christian commitment to unification could be summed up in the four words of Jesus printed on a banner behind the Gethsemane Church in East Berlin. It said, keep watch and pray. Christians recognized that prayer, more than anything else, had kept their movement miraculously nonviolent. The Soviet Union collapsed and the Cold War was ended without bloodshed or violence. Have you ever considered that? That is an incredible miracle. And a high-ranking member of the Socialist Party later said, we were prepared for everything, but not for candles and prayers, is what he said. So that's, that spiritual power is influencing that you know, party official who basically said, we were not ready for the prayers of the church. And there's a lot more that happened in the world that contributed to the Soviet Union collapsing. But I'd never heard that story about the church in East Germany keeping up these links as a unified people across the border and working together and adopting this amazing you know, slogan and putting patches on. And they were beaten up for this. It wasn't all happy. You know, if you got on the wrong side, you'd be like sent to Siberia or something. But it, look what happened. You know, the church's unity defeated, in part, this horrible evil empire. And that, you know, this is what Ephesians is talking about. There's a, a, a real force of spiritual evil. And if we are unified together, God is going to kick its bum, basically, through us, through the church. So it's amazing. And I hope that just encourages us. That's just my real heart for us as a church is that we see that when we're united together, which is hard because we're all very different, and actually we need to get ready to be more different. You know, we need a lot, if this is going to work properly as a church, we need a lot more oddballs coming in, and we're all going to have to get used to each other. Um, so get ready for that, because that will be a good thing if that happens. Um, is everyone in, you stayed with me for that? Cool. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the history lesson, Simon says. Um, I'm just going to pray, and then I'm going to invite Claire up, um, who's uh, going to lead us in a song. Um, I would really love just, if anyone is kind of inspired by that and, you know, wants to um, 
pray about it together. Let, let's find a way to do that. But I want to be sensitive to not breaking the law. Um, so um, maybe at the end, maybe stick your hand up and <laughs> if you particularly want to uh, have prayer or, or something like that and we can find a way to pray together uh, but really this is this is for all of us as a church you know i don't want to do the typical kind of altar call where the enthusiasts come everyone needs to get this it's for everyone so father I, I thank you i thank you jesus for your victory that you are seated above all power and authority you are in total control, Jesus. You have defeated evil. And it's, it's for us as your followers to, to see that victory where we are in Twerton, to our faithful witness to you, Jesus, of following you and taking every decision in light of that freedom that we have in you, but in bringing unity and getting rid of doubt and division between us that that is what will see these statistics about Twerton changed. Jesus, uh, just help us, help us to follow you more clearly, more, more, um, more courageously. Help us to support each other and get ready for more oddballs in the church, for it looking different, because we, we will actually know that we are succeeding if things start to look messier. So Jesus, prepare us for that and just help us in our missional community weeks where we're, we're scattered, we're out in the community. Let us know this is the power and authority that we have. We are victorious in you in this kind of spiritual realm. Thank you, Jesus, for that word for us. Amen.